Physical Gold Fund presents The Gold Chronicles with Jim Ricketts. Insights and analysis about economics, geopolitics, global finance and gold. I'm John Ward on behalf of Physical Gold Fund. We're delighted to welcome you to our latest webinar with Jim Rickards in the series we're calling The Gold Chronicles. Jim Rickards is a New York Times bestselling author and the chief global strategist for West Shore Funds. He's the former general counsel of long-term capital management. He's a consultant to the US intelligence community and to the Department of Defense. He's also an advisory board member of Physical Gold Fund. Hello, Jim, and welcome. Hi, John. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. I am doing good, thanks. And we also have with us Alex Stanzik of Physical Gold Fund. Hello, Alex. Hello, John. Great to be here. Alex, we'll be looking out for questions that come from you, our listeners. So let me just say that your questions for Jim Rickards today are more than welcome. You can post them at any point during the interview. You'll see a box on your screen for typing in your question. And as time allows, we'll do our best to respond to you. Jim, I'd like to begin with a very interesting question that Alex himself raised in a recent conversation. He was commenting on what has been called the war on cash. What he means by that is that there's been increasing chatter about the coming disappearance of old-fashioned cash, bills and coins that you carry in your wallet or purse. One implication of this, of course, is a major expansion of financial surveillance and, as Alex points out, a greater ease for governments to seize assets. So my question to you, Jim, is do you see the cashless society as something happening in the foreseeable future? And if so, what in particular are the implications for gold, which you've always insisted is itself a form of money? John, that's a great question. Uh, it's got a lot of parts. So let me kind of um, go through those one at a time. First of all, what's sometimes called the, the war on cash or the drive to a cashless society, not only do I see it coming, it's sort of here. Uh, it's kind of it, it, like a lot of things that involve the loss of liberty. I think it's snuck up on a lot of people and it's already here and people don't quite realize it because they – uh, yeah, they have a few bucks in their wallet. You know, you pull out your wallet or, or your purse, and you look in. You might have whatever, fifty, hundred, a couple hundred bucks. Uh, what in Philadelphia we used to call walking around money, and that's fine. And maybe you put a, you know, hundred dollars in in a birthday card every now and then. So cash is still out there. But if you think about it, what you do day in day out, you know, if you have a paycheck, it's probably direct deposit from your employer. Most of the money you spend is probably either a credit card or a debit card. Uh, maybe you do some wire transfers, certainly moving money back and forth between money market accounts and brokerage accounts and your bank accounts. That's all digital. So probably you know, 99% of what you do is already digital. And you think that sort of cash is available, but it really isn't. I mean, we're even at the point where, you know, maybe four bucks at the Starbucks counter, you're buying a latte or something. You probably just swipe your debit card, not really even reach in your pocket and, and you know, pull out a $5 bill. So, so the cashless society, the digital society is already here. Um, and then people say, well, well, so what? It just seems really convenient. And I, I, I do all these things, you know, I, I have debit cards and, uh, I'm no different than anyone else when it comes to that. But it does have some implications. First of all, it does set up the world for negative interest rates. Negative interest rates are, people say, well, what are those? Well, you know, basically you put $100,000 in the bank and at a 1% negative interest rate, you come back a year later and you've got $99,000. You know, as instead of giving you one or two or five thousand dollars of interest which is the way it used to work they'll actually take away part of your money as as a negative interest rate this is designed to get people to spend it because well if you spend it they're not going to take it away but if you leave it in the bank they will so it's kind of a way to force people into spending money to get the economy moving that's not really working the economy has more serious structural defects but that's sort of the idea behind it the other idea behind it is to get to a negative real interest rates. That's a little more complicated, but a real rate is basically the rate that you get minus inflation. So a typical way of thinking about it, let's say uh, you get a 5% interest rate and inflation is 3%. 
So you do 5 minus 3 and your real gain is 2% because you have to adjust for inflation. Well, what do you do when inflation is deflation? In other words, you're subtracting a negative. This kind of goes back to a, a sixth or seventh grade math problem where when you subtract a negative, you add the absolute value. So now, if you have a 1% interest rate, positive 1%, but inflation is actually deflation, so let's say negative 2. Uh, so now what's the real interest rate? Well, it's 1 minus negative 2, which is plus 2, which is 3. So if it's 3% real interest rate is very high if you're trying to get people to borrow money and invest. So if you want to get the economy going, you have to have negative real rates. But how do you get to a negative real rate in a world of deflation? Well, you have to have a negative interest rate. So a simple example would be if deflation is minus 1, but the interest rate on your bank account is you know, minus 3, well, minus 3 minus negative one is minus two, so that's a negative real rate, so that's designed to get people to spend money. So it's a little bit through the looking glass world, but that's the world we're living in. So they're setting people up for negative interest rates, either to take your money or to induce you to spend it. To do that, they have to get rid of cash, because going back to my 100,000 example, $100,000 example, the person with 100,000 in the bank leaves it there, comes back a year later and has 99 because of the negative 1% interest rate. But if you took the money out and had the 100000 in cash, so you got a stack of uh, $1,100 bills and you put it in a safe place, you come back a year later, you still have 100000 Your neighbor has 99 but you have 100 because you didn't leave it in the bank. So cash is a very easy way to defeat negative interest rates. So to encourage or to force people into negative interest rates, you have to get rid of cash. Now, there are other aspects to it. Obviously, there's a war on drugs. Drug dealers like to use cash. Uh, there's a war on terror. Terrorists like to use cash. So the uh, government authorities are always going to say, well, we're not really against everyday citizens. We're just trying to get those bad drug dealers and those bad terrorists and you know, tax evaders and others. And that's why we don't allow people to have cash. But there are tons and tons of good legitimate reasons to have cash. You might have a cash business. You might want to, you know, as I say, have some cash for emergencies. You know, if you're, if you live where I do, uh, you know, we're very vulnerable to hurricanes here on the East Coast and at worst storms. And the power goes out. When the power goes out, the ATMs don't work. So it's good to have a little bit of cash around for occasions like that. But uh, basically, the war on cash is designed to uh, set us up for negative interest rates, set us up for confiscation, encourage people to spend their money. But to do that, you need people, you need to herd everybody into one of these big banks in the form of digital wealth and get rid of physical cash. Now, by the way, this is very reminiscent, very reminiscent of what happened to gold in the uh, uh, early part of the 20th century from around 1910 to 1914. You know, if you were in anywhere in the United States in, say, the 1890s and you had to pay for something, you might very well reach in your pocket and pull out a gold dollar or, or, or a silver dollar. Uh, maybe it was a gold five dollar coin or whatever, but people carried around solid silver, solid gold coins. I remember when I was a kid, a, a quarter and, or dime was still solid silver. It was only in the 1960s that they debased it by adding um, copper and zinc and a couple other alloys. But how, so how did they get people to give up their gold coins? Well, what they did, they took the gold and they, this was the origin of the 400 ounce bar. I'm sure people who follow the physical gold fund have probably seen a picture of me from uh, the trip to Switzerland where I'm holding a 400 ounce bar. And they're not light, by the way, they weigh a good 30 pounds. So it's like lifting a heavy free weight. But what they did is they said, okay, you can have gold. This was, again, back, this was not 1933 after, after Franklin Delano Roosevelt made gold illegal. This was in, you know, 1914, 1920, in that time period when gold was still legal. But what they did is they mailed it down all the coins, took the coins out of circulation and put it into 400 ounce bars. Now, nobody's going to walk around with a 400 ounce bar in their pocket. So they said to people, well, OK, uh, you can own gold, but it's not going to be in the form of coins anymore. It's going to be in the form of these bars. And by the way, these bars were very expensive. And so you needed a lot of money to have one. And you weren't going to take it anywhere. You were going to leave it in a, a bank vault. So there was a process uh, gradually. People didn't seem to notice of substituting paper money for gold coins without making gold illegal all at once. And the way they did that was they put, put these gold bars, uh, these 400, created these 400 ounce gold bars, very large quantities, and got rid of gold coins. And then 
then later they made gold completely illegal. But by the time they did that in 1933, not very many people were using gold coins. They had paper money. They just thought they could go get gold and found out they couldn't. So this whole war on cash reminds me of the, of the war on gold coins uh, from early in the 20th century. But it's the same process. It's forcing people into the banks, herding people into a small number of institutions, making it less and less convenient to have the old form of money and more convenient to have the new form of money, but the new form of money uh, implies tighter forms of government control. And people don't really notice uh, until it's too late. So uh, one of the reasons, um, and kind of, we've kind of come full circle, because I, I talked about the, the war on gold in the first half of the 20th century. Now in the 21st century, we're seeing a war on cash. But the part of the solution is to go back to gold because, of course, gold is now legal. Uh, it, was, it was illegal and inconvenient earlier in the 20th century, but now it is a legal form of ownership. Uh, you can buy large bars if you want. Uh, you can buy one kilo bars, which are a lot more convenient than 400-ounce uh, bars. But you can also buy gold coins. You know, the U.S. Mint will sell an American gold eagle or American buffalo. It's a one-ounce solid gold coin. Physical gold fund, of course, has larger quantities uh, in their structure. But the point is, now that gold is, is legal and convenient, uh, it actually becomes a way to get out of the way of this digitation of uh, money and the, and the war on cash. So I, I do think it's significant. I think it's being done for a purpose. Uh, the purpose is to impose negative interest rates and to give people nowhere to go, basically. And they can also lock down the system, uh, not only uh, impose negative interest rates, but actually uh, do a Cyprus type uh, situation where they can reprogram the ATMs and say you can only have, uh, say, $300 a day for gas and groceries. And they would, the authorities would say, well, why do you need more than $300 a day for gas and groceries? We have a temporary emergency. Uh, we need to stop a run on the banks. We're going to lock down the bank accounts. and. Uh, uh, and only let you get that much kind of walking around money, uh, and you don't really need more than that. So all this uh, you know, war on cash digitization uh, is basically setting people up for two things. One, negative interest rates, and eventually a freeze on the bank accounts um, in the event of uh, some kind of emergency. And so it probably is prudent, uh, but I think that it's very, very difficult to get cash. I mean, go down to the bank and ask them for $5,000. I mean, there's nothing illegal about it, but you might uh, be required to, you know, show some ID, sign a bunch of things, uh, have reports filed um, with the government, you know, uh, suspicious uh, SARs, what are called form SAR, suspicious activity report, currency transaction report, CTR. There's a whole um, reporting network around this. So I think it's almost too late to get your hands on cash, but it's not too late to get some gold. Well, thanks, Jim. I'd like to turn to a different topic, the subject of your first book, Currency Wars. And it's a topic that surfaced recently in a political dogfight here in the United States. The Obama administration has been trying to push through the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a wide-ranging free trade agreement. And a major stumbling block for Congress, or some parts of Congress, is the failure of the Trans-Pacific Partnership to address currency manipulation, specifically by China. Well, it's not often that we see currency wars at the center of focus in public debate. And I was curious to know what your view on this is. Well, uh, as you know, John, the currency war started, at least the one we're in now, started in 2010. Uh, here we are in 2015. It's still going strong. And I've said many times that we're not, the world is not always in a currency war, but when we are in a currency war, they can go on for five or 10 or 15 years, sometimes longer. So I'm not the least bit surprised that here we are five years into this currency war and it's still going on. It's still a topic for conversation. And I think that will continue. I think we could come back a year from now, maybe two years from now on one of these physical gold fund podcasts and we'd still be talking about the currency wars. now. Wars have battles and the tide of war ships back and forth. So there's always something new to say about currency wars. You know, in 2011, it was the weak dollar. In 2012, uh, with Abenomics, it was the weak yen. Beginning in 2014, coming into 2015, with negative interest rates in Europe and quantitative easing by Mario Draghi, it's now the weak euro, although I think the euro is bouncing back. So this is just the world taking turns because, of course, not every currency can devalue against every other currency all at the same time. Some, if some currency is going to be weak, 
some other currency has to be strong. It cannot be any other way. It's like uh, I analogize it to two kids on a seesaw on the playground. I don't even know if they ha they still have seesaws. They they were considered dangerous. But when I was a kid, you had a seesaw, and you know. But if, if somebody is down, the other person is up, and vice versa. So if the dollar is down, the euro can be up. But if the dollar is going to get stronger, then the euro has to get weaker, and, and vice versa. So these things go back and forth. Uh, it's like a real war. You know, you, you go back to World War Two. Uh, the U.S. Uh, was pretty badly beaten up at, at Pearl Harbor, and the French uh, surrendered to Germany in the early going of World War II. And in 1942, it looked like Japan were going to sweep the border. It looked like Germany was going to take over Europe, and Japan was going to take it over Asia. But the tide of battle turned, and those uh, had very different outcomes. And it's the same thing in the currency wars. Uh, one currency looks like the strong one for a while, but that can uh, quickly turn around. So let's sort of take that background on currency wars and put it into these trade negotiations, and you're exactly right. And it's not only the Trans-Pacific Partnership, that's a big deal, but there's another one uh, negotiated, being negotiated at the same time called the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. So the Obama administration is working on major multilateral free trading NAFTA-type deals with our Pacific Rim trading partners and our European trading partners all at the same time. And the currency manipulation has been uh, thrust into the middle of this. Now, the conventional wisdom that I think the White House operates by is this whole theory of free trade uh, comes from uh, the economist David Ricardo and um, his theory of uh, comparative advantage. And what he said was, you know, let's say you have two trading partners and uh, one's really good at making wine and the other one's really good at making textiles. Well, they ought to trade wine for textiles. It doesn't necessarily make sense for the wine producing country to go out and, you know, create a textile industry and it doesn't make sense for the textile producing country to plant grapes let them trade with each other and they're both better off. And there is something to that. I'm not saying that that's a, a nonsensical theory. As a pure theory, it makes some sense. But there are all kinds of qualifications to that. And one of the uh, big qualifications is, okay, we're going to have comparative advantage. We're going to say that certain countries are better at certain things than others. And they ought to focus on those and then trade with their trading partners to get the things that their trading partners are good at. And everybody's better off. That's the theory. Well, how do you measure comparative advantage? You have to measure it in the price of inputs. You know, what's the cost of labor? What's the cost of capital? What are your natural resource endowments? What's your technology? You've got to look at all those things that are your, your inputs, your factors of production. To, and, and weigh them up to find out where you have your comparative advantage. Well, how do you figure out prices? Well, you use currencies. You use dollars and yen or yuan, etc. Well, what if I'm manipulating my currency? All of a sudden, the whole theory of comparative advantage goes out the window because if I'm using prices to determine my comparative advantage, and if comparative advantage is supposed to dictate the terms to trade, and that's the basis for coming up with a free trade area, but someone's manipulating the currency and distorting the price mechanism, then you could be kind of a sucker. If you're allowing free trade with a trading partner who is manufacturing its comparative advantage out of thin air by manipulating the currency, then you're just a sucker in, uh, in that poker game. You know, there's an old saying, John, if you're, if you're at a table with four or five people and you're playing poker and you don't know who the sucker is, you're the sucker. In other words, everyone else is ganged up on you. And the U.S. looks more and more like the sucker in free trade because we don't really suspect or understand what trading partners are doing to, to kind of rig the game. So the other problem with um, Ricardo's theory of uh, comparative advantage is it assumes that the factors of production are immobile. In other words, they stay in one place. So if you're comparing U.S. and China, you would say, okay, you know, maybe China has a comparative advantage in labor. But maybe the United States has a comparative advantage in capital because we have more developed capital markets, better rule of law, et cetera. And since labor and capital are both factors of production, let them compete, you know, in a level playing field and may the best country win. That's kind of a fair trade uh, or free trade type of argument. But what if uh, the capital picks up and moves to China? In other words, what if the factors of production are not immobile? What if they're highly mobile in a globalized society? So all of a sudden, China has the cheap labor and the cheap capital, and that that's encouraged by currency manipulation. So that's really the point of the, of the president's opponents. Uh, I don't think the president's a good listener. In fact, I know he's not. He tends to get an idea in his head and assume he's right and not be very, as I say, not a good listener and not really 
willing to understand what the other side is saying. It just tends to polarize and demonize the issue a little bit. But I do think that um, some of the opponents of these trade agreements in the Congress do have a point. They're not all protectionists. They're not all, you know, tub thumping, uh, high tariff trade bashers. They're actually, I think, fairly thoughtful in a lot of cases. And they're saying, hey, U.S. United States, you need to wake up and realize that you're the sucker at the poker game and you need to do something about it. So it's interesting to see, and you're right, having written a book uh, uh, four years ago on currency wars, um, the one thing I said at the time is they're not going away quickly, and that has uh, turned out to be the case. You have been listening to The Gold Chronicles with Jim Rickards, presented by Physical Gold Fund. Recordings can be found at physicalgoldfund.com forward slash podcasts. You can register there for news of upcoming interviews with Jim Rickards and other world-class thinkers.